what we've done so far um, assumes either that we have a very large sample size, like n greater than 300, or that the standard deviation is known. There's no uncertainty uh, in the standard deviation. So as long as we have something very accurate for sigma, we can use z. Yes, question? Yes, just the standard deviation of the sample. Yeah, we either, we either know sigma because we have it from it calculated from an entire population, or we estimate standard deviation from the sample, and if it's a very large sample, like greater than 300, then we can assume that it's, it's close enough to the population not to worry about it. Um, as I'll show you, you can, um, even for large sample sizes, you can still use t, um, but it's especially important that, that you use this distribution when you're estimating the standard deviation from a small sample. Um, and it was developed by this guy, William Gossett, who called himself student because he wasn't supposed to be publishing papers as he worked for, for Guinness. Um, but but he, he was doing quality control for, for uh, batches of beer and wanting to know if they were systematically varying from properties that were that were supposed to be fixed for the beer, like alcohol content, um, and found that when he calculated things like confidence intervals and p-values to to try to make a decision about whether you know something had changed in their manufacturing process, um, there was too much variability when he used uh, a normal distribution and figured out that, that the reason for that was because of this uncertainty in estimating the standard deviation and uh, developed this T distribution to deal with it. So for given a sample, you're going to calculate the t-statistic in the same way that you calculated the z-score. So it is, it is a property of a sampling distribution. The only difference is that when we, the population standard deviation is unknown, um, and you're estimating it s from the sample, we're going to call this a t-statistic. And I'll show you that, that the distribution <coughs> Of, of values that you estimate in this way is a little bit different than the distribution of, of z-scores that you estimate as we have before. So when we don't know sigma, the usual case, we estimate the standard deviation of individuals from a, from a sample the standard error is not going to be sigma over square root of n, it's going to be s over the square root of n. And the reason that that matters is that it turns out that, that the, the thing that looks like the z-score is not actually normally distributed. It, it is t-distributed. So we're going to assume that we're drawing individuals from a normally distributed population uh, with, with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Then this one sample t statistic is just for the sample, the mean of the sample minus the known or the hypothesized uh, population mean divided by the standard error estimated from estimated from the sample. And this is for small samples or for any sample size, it's T distributed with N minus one degrees of freedom. Um, and I'll tell you how to calculate degrees of freedom in a minute. But the important thing is that this T distribution depends on sample size. So 
So unlike the, the standard normal distribution where there's just one of them, um, there's a different distribution for different sample sizes. That distribution is still symmetric and centered around zero and bell-shaped. So it looks similar, um, but the, the, the difference is, is that the tails are a little bit wider in the T distribution. And the fewer samples, and as a result, fewer degrees of freedom, um, the, the wider that distribution is. And as sample size gets very large, it becomes more and more similar to the standard normal distribution with, um, with standard deviation one. So I thought it would just be useful here to show you how it differs from uh, from the normal distribution by looking at the table from your textbook. Uh, let's look at the, the two-tailed distribution uh, with the probability of um, 0.05 in the tails. So, so it's showing you for two tails, it's the probability, it's where you have a total area or probability of 0.05 distributed between those two tails. So degrees of freedom, this is just your sample size minus one for the, for the one sample test. Um, for one degree of freedom, it's actually 12.7. Whereas, um, oops. Let's see, it's this one that we want to look at. I'm going to circle it. And over here, it's this one. So for infinite, let's start from this end. For infinite degrees of freedom, or n equals uh, degrees of freedom of 500, it's 1.96 a number that you know. So your, uh, your width of the interval that contains 95% um, that contains of your probability is plus or minus 1.96 on the unit of t um, for very large sample size. But as you get down even to 30 degrees of freedom, or 29 degrees of freedom, that would be a sample size of 30, it's 2.05. So that was why I said greater than, than 300 to actually, um, to, to still use a normal distribution when you are estimating standard deviation from a sample. Because even at n equals 30, we've gone from um, 1.96 up to 2.05. It's not a trivial difference. So just a little bit more on this this idea of the degrees of the degrees of freedom. Um, it, it's something that that you'll calculate in a number of different situations. For the one sample test, it's easy. It's it's your sample size minus one. But more generally, uh, it's the number of independent observations that you need to calculate uh, that statistic or that, that you did use to calculate the statistic minus the number of parameters that are estimated in the mean time. So in, in this case, we estimate the mean x bar, and that's the only thing um, that, uh, and that takes away one degree of freedom. Um, alternatively, and maybe an easier way to, to think about it in most cases, it's if you know the value of the st statistic, it's how many observations you could take away and recover them from, from having that value. And in, in this case, you could take away 
one of your data points, and if you knew the T statistic, you could calculate what that data point was again. So if you have a normally distributed population, we're still making that assumption, um, but you're estimating the standard deviation from the sample, and you're gonna use the T, the T distribution for constructing your confidence interval, and you'll use it for more things in, in future classes. Um, and instead of using the plus or minus Z alpha over two, or 1.96 for, for the 95% interval, you'll use this T alpha over two. Um, alpha being, being given by this equation, it's one, it's one minus the percent of your confidence interval. So for a 95% confidence interval, um, it's one minus 0 0.05 times 100. So this, so the 95% confidence interval alpha is 0 0.05. For the 99% confidence interval, alpha is 0 0.01. So you would take that alpha, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, divide it by two, and your degrees of freedom, and you would look up the value of t that you use instead of looking up something on your z table. Um, and it's just a little bit more complicated because instead of before you like looked up your z statistic, there was just one of them, so you would get like rows, you know, to get your first decimal place, and then columns to get your your second decimal place. Um, with the, the T table, you only have you only have one column for each uh, specified probability value. So you, it's not nearly as fine grained as as what you had for the standard normal distribution. Um, but you can for important values like alpha over two equals 0.025, you can look up the value for your given degrees of freedom. And you're going to get some practice doing this. I also put a link to a video that can walk you through it step by step using using your table. So here's an example of of, of using it. Suppose we've got um, uh, a small batch of beer with just, um, or we've got. We've got five homebrewed batches of beer. We take a sample from, from each of them and we calculate their, their alcohol contents. Then we want to construct a 95% confidence interval for the average alcohol content that the procedures we're we are using are going to give. And then the related hypothesis test, which we're not really getting into until next class would be is there evidence against some particular null hypothesis, such as um, the average alcohol content being 5%? So if we were gonna do this, and I guess we're a little bit short on time to actually go through it, first step would be to calculate the mean of these five values calculate the standard deviation of those five values. From the standard deviation, we calculate the standard error, which is gonna be standard deviation over square root of five. What's gonna be the degrees of freedom? Four, yep. So at a 95% confidence interval, we would go back to this table Look under the, the uh, two tails, 0.05. So for four degrees of freedom, T is 2.78. We're gonna use this 2.78. And then we're gonna use this formula for the confidence interval. with T equal to 2.78, 2.78. So it'll be the, the mean of those five values 
plus or minus 2.78 times the standard deviation over square root of 5. Is that okay? It's pretty, it's pretty mechanical. Once you do it a few times, it'll be fine. Um, and this null to test this null hypothesis, in this case, all we would have to do is see whether that 95% confidence interval includes includes the value of five. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to use one tail too much. It's sort of it's. There are not many situations where you want to do a one-tailed test, um, but no, you would use the same distribution. It's just you you would calculate the area under only one tail. So, if you were doing a one-tailed hypothesis test at an alpha of 0.05, instead of using this this uh, 2.78, you would use this one that is 2.13. Right, you're going to use alpha instead of alpha over 2. So, yeah, because you can you can imagine if if this if this area here contains 0 0.05 of your probability, then if you want the value that contains 0.05 under both tails, it's going to be something a little bit further out like that. Yeah, I, I don't like getting too much into one-tailed tests because they can, get, they can get confusing in that the direction matters as, as well. Like, um, it matters whether your observed value is above or below and what your one-sided hypothesis test was um, and they're more they're more easily questioned than a two-tailed test they're less conservative so just to summarize the assumptions we still have to assume data come from a statistically random sample from a population that is normally distributed unless we have some very large sample size These procedures are what we call robust in that the outcome is not too sensitive to the assumptions made. And particularly, it's not too sensitive to this assumption of a normally distributed uh, population. So it's not too sensitive. And additionally, it tends to be conservative um, in that if that assumption is violated, it will tend to result in us giving a confidence interval that is too large or a p-value that is too large. It won't tend to make you too, comp, uh, too sure of your results. You'll be not sure enough of them. Uh, with the exception that one-sided tests tend not to work well if, if the assumption of normality is violated. Here are just some sort of rule of thumb practical guidelines. Um, if you have a sample size of less than 15, use the T procedures if your data are close to normal. Otherwise, you'll need what we call a non-parametric alternative. If sample size is more than 15 but less than 30, then you can use the T procedure unless there are major outliers or uh, skewness. And if you have a large sample size greater than 30 or 40, then you can use the T distribution anyways, even in the presence of outliers and skew. But that assumption of the statistically random sample is always important. If that doesn't hold, then all bets are off. All right, one more Q&A before I let you go. Um, when estimating standard deviation from the sample, instead of knowing it from the population, do you use the t-distribution? Hmm? Yep. True, yep. That's when we use it. 
Um, is the 95% confidence interval going to be larger or smaller when using the T distribution rather than when using Z? Mm -hmm. Larger, that's right. Yeah, the tails are the tails are fatter on the T distribution. Um, and as N increases, the T-based confidence interval becomes more similar um, uh, to the Z-based confidence interval. True. Good. Just to wrap up, um, so the confidence interval is, it's an interval that is likely to contain the true population mean, and it represents our uncertainty due to sampling var variation. If you want a high confidence, then you need a large margin of error to be more sure that you don't make a mistake, that that, that margin of error really does contain the true population mean. Your best estimate from the sample is at the middle of your confidence interval. The standard error um, and the confidence interval have to do with properties of the sampling distribution, so they don't tell you anything about variable variability in the population. They tell you, tell you about variability of the average averages of samples. Uh, and when we have small samples and we're estimating the standard deviation from the sample, use the t-distribution. <laughs>